from historic graveyards that are roamed by the spirits of those laid to rest within, to military forts harboring the ghosts of those who served on site centuries past. Are you sure you're ready to brave some of the most haunted places in Charleston, South Carolina? Number 5. The Unitarian Church Graveyard The Unitarian Church Graveyard is a historic cemetery located in Charleston, South Carolina that acts as a final resting place to many notable Charlestonians, including Revolutionary War soldiers, early settlers, and prominent African Americans. This prominent yard is also home to the Unitarian Church, a historic church that dates back to the 1770s. The church has played an important role in Charleston's history as a whole, serving as a place of worship, as a meeting place for civil rights activists, and as a shelter for victims of natural disasters. The Unitarian Church graveyard is said to be haunted by the spirits of those buried there, and both staff and visitors have reported seeing apparitions and hearing strange noises while walking through the cemetery. Some have even claimed to feel the touch of ghostly hands or to see objects moving on their own. One of the most famous legends associated with this graveyard is that of Annabelle Lee. According to this legend, Lee was a young woman who died sometime through the 1800s and that was buried in the graveyard, and visitors have reported seeing her ghostly form walking through the cemetery, clad in a white dress. Number 4. The Powder Magazine the Powder Magazine is a historic building located in Charleston, South Carolina. Built in 1713, the Powder Magazine served as a storage facility for gunpowder and other explosives during the colonial period. The Powder Magazine played an important role in the American Revolution and was used as a military hospital through the Civil War. The building has been preserved and is now open to the public as a museum. Chillingly, there are reports of hauntings and paranormal activity within the Powder Magazine, with visitors telling of hearing unexplained noises and seeing apparitions while touring the museum. Some have claimed to feel a sense of unease or to experience sudden drops in temperature. One of the most famous stories associated with the Powder Magazine is that of the Lady in Red. According to this legend, a ghostly woman clad in a red dress haunts the building and is possibly the ghost of a former resident. Number 3. The Circular Congregational Church Graveyard The Circular Congregational Church Graveyard is a historic cemetery located in Charleston, South Carolina. The graveyard was established in the late 18th century and is the final resting place to many notable Charlestonians, including to early settlers, veterans of domestic wars, and prominent social figures. This graveyard is also home to the Circular Congregational Church, a historic chapel that dates back to the 1680s. Like our first church, this church has also played an important role in Charleston's history, serving not only as a place of worship, but also as a hospital through the Civil War, and as a meeting place for civil rights activists during the 1960s. The circular Congregational Church graveyard is said to be haunted by the spirits of those buried there, and both staff and visitors have reported seeing apparitions and hearing strange noises while walking amongst its rows. Some have even claimed to feel the touch of ghostly hands or to see objects move on their own. One of the most famous legends associated with this graveyard is that of Sue Howard Hardy. According to this legend, Hardy was a young woman who died in the 1800s and was buried in the graveyard, and many have reported seeing her ghostly figure walking about in a white dress and holding a bouquet of flowers. Number 2. Fort Sumter Fort Sumter is a historic sea fort located in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, that's best known as the site of the First Battle of the American Civil War, which took place on April 12th of 1861. During this confrontation, Confederate forces bombarded the fort, which was occupied by Union soldiers, forcing them to surrender after a 34-hour bombardment. The battle marked the beginning of a long and bloody conflict that would shape the course of American history as a whole. Following the fight, Fort Sumter remained a symbol of the Civil War and its impact on the nation, and today, it acts as part of the National Park Service and is open to visitors who want to learn more about its role in American history. Not surprisingly, there are many stories of hauntings and paranormal activity within Fort Sumter, with some reporting feeling a sense of unease or sadness while on site and others of seeing ghostly figures and hearing unexplained noises. One of the most famous stories associated with Sumter is the legend of the Grey Man. According to this legend, a ghostly figure dressed in grey appears on the beach near the fort before hurricanes or other major natural disasters. 
The Gray Man is said to be the spirit of a man who died in a shipwreck near the fort and that now warns people of impending danger, lest they suffer the same fate. In addition to the Gray Man, there have also been reports of other ghostly apparitions and strange sounds at Fort Sumter, some of which that include the ghostly figures of both Union and Confederate soldiers, and others of hearing the phantom sounds of cannon fire or of marching footsteps. Number 1. The Old City Jail the Old City Jail is a historic building located in Charleston, South Carolina that was completed in 1802 and served as a jail until 1939. During its more than 130 years of operation, this jail housed a variety of criminals, including pirates, Civil War prisoners, and some of Charleston's most notorious figures. Conditions in the jail were notoriously harsh, and prisoners were often subjected to overcrowding, disease, and inhumane treatment. Incidentally, the building's dark history has made it a popular destination for those interested in the supernatural. There are many stories of hauntings and paranormal activity at the Old City Jail, with visitors telling of a sense of unease or sadness while on site, and others reporting seeing ghostly figures or hearing unexplained noises. One of the most famous stories associated with the jail is the legend of Lavinia Fisher, Charleston's first female serial killer. According to this legend, Fisher and her husband John lured unsuspecting travelers to their inn, where they would rob and murder them, and it's told Lavinia's ghost still haunts the Old City Jail, along with the spirits of the many other prisoners who died within its walls. In addition to the spirits of former prisoners, there have been reports of ghostly apparitions and strange sounds at the Old City Jail, with visitors also telling of hearing the sounds of footsteps, rattling chains, and voices. While these claims are unverified, they do add to a sense of history and intrigue surrounding the Old City Jail, making it a popular destination for those interested in the otherworldly. Charleston, South Carolina, the ground dumb of the Old South. For over 300 years, people have reported encounters with mysterious apparitions in this fabled city. A love-struck poet who wanders the house in which he died. A beautiful murderess still imprisoned in an abandoned jail. A slave boy who teases guests at a popular inn. A Confederate hero who keeps watch over City Hall. The headless torso of a soldier killed in the waning days of the Civil War. Products of overactive imaginations? Perhaps. Or maybe they are the manifestations of spirits who want their stories told. The cultural and commercial capital of the antebellum South. The birthplace of the Confederacy. Today, Charleston is a thriving shipping center and tourist destination. A city permeated with a sense of history. The past is very much alive in Charleston, in more ways than one. Many people believe that the spirits of the dead still wander these quiet streets. You can't have over 300 years of history and not have the spirits present that have gone before us. And Charleston is the most ideal setting that I can think of. And the spirits deserve to be heard. In the past, I have not believed in ghosts at all. And I was probably like a majority of people that poo-pooed the whole thing. But as time has gone on in the last 10 years, I have encountered uh, strange things happening. So whether you want to put the name ghost to it or spirit, it's, it's up to you. But there is something here. It should not be surprising that Charleston would be a home to many legends of ghosts and otherworldly spirits. The city dates back to the earliest days of the American colonies, and many of the original townhouses and mansions are still standing. In the historic section near the Battery, more than 70 buildings predate the Revolution. More than 200 were built before the War of 1812, and more than 850 were constructed before the Civil War. Come this way with me. This house was built in 1845, and recently the owner converted it into a very fine, charming inn. And in the back of this building, 
Julian Buxton III is a native Charlestonian and a former investment banker and college professor. Since 1995, he and fellow historian and author Ed Macy have conducted tours of Charleston's historic sites that are associated with ghostly tales and legends. And he's come back even though he... I don't know how to account for the abundance of Charleston supernatural activity. I don't know if it's simply because the residents here have been on the Swampy Peninsula for over 320 years now, or if it's because of the numerous catastrophes and disasters that have have been rained upon the city, war, fire, plague, hurricane, and earthquake. Or maybe it springs from the mighty Antebellum Agricultural Society with its beauty and wealth, and of course its lesser acknowledged dark side of slavery. When you're walking around the place, you sense spirits, you sense the history, you sense the people that have been here, and you sense all the incredible tribulation and human drama that has been experienced in this place, not just war, but all the families and all the different decades and generations that have been here. People actually live here and work here, and yet when you walk through it, you can actually feel that you're back in the 1700s or 1800s very easily. Charleston is one of the oldest continually occupied settlements in the United States. British colonists drawn to its deep, well-protected harbor first settled in the area in 1670. The city of Charlestown, named in honor of King Charles II, thrived on the trade resulting from the indigo, rice, and cotton produced on the nearby great plantations. There is a Charleston ghost story dating back to the earliest days of the plantations, associated with a strange-looking plant seen hanging on trees throughout the South, known as Spanish moss. Some say it's a a plant that lives in the trees, but many of us know that back in the 1700s, there was a Cuban that came up here with his Spanish fiance, and they were going to be married. And he was going to open a big plantation on the outskirts of Charleston. Well, one thing about his beautiful bride-to-be was that she had long, black, beautiful, shiny hair. As they were traveling out to get set up and start their plantation, the Cherokees killed both of them and buried them under a live oak tree. And as a final insult, they tore off her beautiful, long, black hair and hung it in a tree. It's just a sign to others, don't mess with the Cherokee Nation. Well, they'd come back day after day and week after week, and they noticed that not only had the hair shriveled up and turned gray, that it was spread throughout the tree. And wherever these Cherokees went, they'd look up in the live oak trees, and there was the moss following them. And it chased them out of the state of South Carolina. And even to this day, if you stand under a live oak tree, you can sometimes hear the moaning of the woman who was killed, and you can watch the moss jump tree to tree. Charlestown became wealthy and prosperous in the early 18th century through its commerce and shipping. With prosperity, however, came predators. Pirates and Spanish marauders were a constant threat to the colony. In 1718, the notorious pirate known as Blackbeard blockaded the city, demanding a ransom of food and provisions. In 1704, the British colonists had completed the construction of a walled fortification around the city. Behind the semicircular fortification known as Half Moon Battery stood the Court of the Guard. Here in the Court of the Guard jail were held some of the most notorious pirates of the era. According to legend, the spirits of these pirates still haunt the waterfront area of Charleston known as the Battery. Among some of the early citizens of Charleston, there were a number who we were not too happy to have here. There were pirates who came looking for loot, and sometimes they were captured in our harbor and were made quite a terrible example for others to see as they were hanged publicly. When these bodies were removed, they were dumped into the harbor. And they say that some of the spirits of those still linger near the battery, and if you walk by with change that jangles in your pocket, you might hear a threat or a request for some of those goods. The pirates who terrorized old Charlestown are long gone, but their ghosts may still haunt the dungeons where they were imprisoned. One of the oldest buildings in Charleston was built on the site of the old Court of the Guard, and according to legend, 
restless spirits still lurk in its dark dungeon. By 1760, Charlestown was the busiest port in the southern American colonies. At any one time, up to 300 ships from great sailing vessels to plantation barges would be at anchor. In 1767, the Court of the Guard was demolished and a large exchange and customs house was constructed on the site. This building, known as the Old Exchange Building, is still standing and is now considered to be one of the most historically significant colonial buildings in the United States. Here in the Great Hall of the Old Exchange Building, colonists met to protest the Tea Act of 1773. In this room, they elected their delegates to the Continental Congress in 1774, and on the steps of the exchange, South Carolina declared independence from Great Britain on March 28, 1776. After British forces took the city in 1780, they imprisoned many of the leading citizens in the provost dungeon of the exchange building. Some people believe that the spirits of the patriots still walk these catacombs. We're in the deep, darkest bowels of this building, and uh, if any spirit should be present, it should be in this area because the first building was also a jail or a dungeon, and it held pirates that were rounded up by the British in the year 1718 and later hanged out at White Point Gardens, what is now today known as Battery. A lot of strange happenings have occurred here in the dungeon area, especially on our dark and gloomy days when the uh, sun goes behind the clouds and uh, there aren't as many guests as usually are present. Sometimes we'll walk in and there's hasn't been a group through in it quite a long time. And we proceed into the dungeon area first over by the Half Moon Battery. And sometimes every one of these chains will be swinging, just swinging in harmony almost. It's like vibrating and uh, shaking up and down. And uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit unnerving. And one time I was out in the dungeon area in the lobby waiting and all of a sudden um, the chain across the doorway that where we enter in just completely dropped onto the floor and it made quite a racket. And it, to tell you the truth, it scared the bejesus out of me. No prisoners have been held in the dungeons since 1782, but perhaps their spirits still wander through these dismal chambers. In this room, just off the Great Hall in the old Exchange Building, the Revolutionary War hero Colonel Isaac Hain was imprisoned by the British before his execution in 1781. According to legend, his spirit haunted the streets of Charleston for nearly 100 years following his death. The American Revolution began in Charleston on June 28, 1776, when Colonel William Moultrie successfully defended nearby Sullivan's Island against British attack, marking the first decisive American victory of the war. In April 1780, British forces under the command of Sir Henry Clinton began a siege of Charlestown. On May 12, after 41 days, the city surrendered. Clinton proclaimed that any person who refused to take an oath of allegiance to the king would be considered a rebel. Isaac Hayne, a respected and affluent landowner, was forced to sign an oath of allegiance, but after continual violations of the agreement by the British, he joined the rebel cause and raised a company of soldiers. In July 1781, Hayne was captured by the British and taken to Charlestown and held in the exchange building. The British governor, Lord Rodden, decided to make an example of Hayne. On July 28th, Isaac Hayne was convicted of treason and sentenced to die. It didn't matter that the city was in an uproar, that there were petitions, that there were pleas for releasing him. Nothing made any difference. And so on August the 4th in 1781, he stood outside of the exchange building as a prisoner. He was marched toward the gate of King Street. As he made his way in that direction, he passed the corner of Atlantic and Meeting Street. On that corner stood the Perrineau House, in which his sister lived. 
She stood in the north second story window, weeping. She watched as the guard took her brother toward the gate of King Street, and weeping called down to him, Oh, Colonel, Colonel, come back to us, return to us. The Colonel looked up and assured her, I'll return, I'll return if I can, and walked on toward the gate. When he neared, he saw gallows had been erected. He spoke to his clergyman, he prayed with them, and he entreated some of his neighbors to take care of his children. And then he himself pulled the hangman's cap down over his head. He stood and himself gave the signal to the hangman. So ended the life of a 37-year-old martyr for his country. He is remembered for that, but also there are those who say for over a hundred years that on the stairwell of the Perrineau house, late in the day, if you are in the second story bedroom at the north side of the house, you could hear his footsteps coming up the step. So perhaps he did try to keep his promise to his sister to return. According to legend, with the outbreak of the Civil War in the 1860s, the ghost of Isaac Haynes ceased his eternal return. Some say it was because he was heartbroken by the sight of patriot fighting patriot after so many men and women had given their lives to win their independence. Many elegant townhouses in Charleston date back to the early 18th century. It should not be surprising that some of these are home to unquiet spirits. Following the American victory in 1782, the former Crown Colony of Charlestown was incorporated as the city of Charleston. It was during these years that the aristocratic codes of antebellum society were set down. Southern society prided itself as being the heir to the Arthurian ideal of chivalry. Fundamental to this belief was the practice of dueling. Even after the practice was outlawed in 1804, dueling remained an integral aspect of Southern society until the time of the Civil War. In the years before the Civil War, in the antebellum years, there was a lot of honor and a lot of pride, which led to a lot of duels, which is, has been the result of at least two ghost stories in this city, men who died in the fields of honor dueling. This Georgian-style house on Church Street was built in 1735 by a wealthy landowner named Thomas Rose. There have been very few changes to the building over the years, and it is today owned by the Church Street Foundation, a private organization dedicated to the preservation of historic homes in the district. According to some, the Thomas Rose House is also home to the ghost of a young man who died in a senseless duel in 1786. In 1783, Dr. Joseph Ladd, a young doctor from Rhode Island, came to Charleston and boarded at the Rose residence. Dr. Ladd was quickly accepted by Charleston society, but he never forgot his beloved Amanda, the girl he had been forced to leave behind. Dr. Ladd spent countless nights composing letters and poems to Amanda, vowing to return for her after he had made his fortune. In one, he writes, Ah, think not absence can afford a cure. To the sharp woes, the sorrows I endure. Amanda, no, twill but augment distress. To such a height, no mortal can express. My soul distracted still is fixed on you. Was ever heart so wretched and so true? Dr. Ladd, however, was destined to never see his love again. He had befriended a local man named Ralph Isaacs. One night, they got into an argument, and Dr. Ladd challenged Isaacs to a duel. On the morning of the duel, the two men met in a field outside of the city of Charleston. Dr. Ladd, who had thought on things in his sleep, cooled down a bit, fired his pistols into the sky as a token gesture. Ralph Isaacs, who was fit of rage, or possibly even still drunk, shot the kneecaps out from under the young man. Dr. Ladd was brought back to the Thomas Rose house. 
He lingered for three weeks until gangrene finally took him. In the years following his untimely death in 1786, Dr. Ladd's apparition has been sensed and, in some cases, seen by the residents of the house on Church Street. He's been seen since 1786. There were sightings then by the Rose Sisters. He's been seen a lot in the 19th century, which uh, has been documented by other researchers. But I've spoken to people who've seen him in the last 30 years. His ghost is still heard on the staircase, walking up and down, very often, more often than not, whistling an English show ballad, the tune that he loved in life, and apparently he's still quite fond of it today. This ghost appears as a very pensive, thoughtful ghost, and he appears during tribulations or when there is a crisis or emotional crisis. He usually appears in a very comforting, protective influence in the house. The uh, present owner has seen him stand on the stairs while she was rushing between rooms with children taking care of him, and the gardener has seen him quite frequently. There is another apparition associated with the Thomas Rose house, often encountered on the second floor and in the garden. Very little is known about this spirit, but she is thought to be that of a little girl who lived here in the 1830s and died on her eighth birthday. Not all of Charleston's spirits are so innocent. The old city jail dates back to 1802. Throughout its history, this imposing fortress was home to some of the worst scoundrels imaginable, and according to some, it is still home to one of the most notorious criminals in Charleston history. The ghost that haunts the old city jail is named Lavinia Fisher. Lavinia and John Fisher owned an inn called the Six Mile House north of Charleston, which would have been in the boondocks in the 1820s. Lavinia Fisher would rob guests and John and their slave would murder them and set their bodies out into the woods just to decompose and bury them. And they would steal all their goods. Lavinia and John Fisher, along with five accomplices, were eventually arrested and brought to Charleston to stand trial for murder. She and her husband were both found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. Lavinia Fisher spent her last days in the old city jail. When they brought her to the public gallows for hanging, they asked her if she had any last words. She looked out over the huge crowd and pointed to them and said, if any of you have anything to tell the devil, tell me now because I'm about to see him. And they strung her up. Soon after that, Lavinia started to haunt the old city jail and still haunts it to this day. Some of the most striking landmarks in Charleston are the numerous stately old churches dating back to the earliest days of the colonies. There are so many churches in Charleston that it is known as the Holy City. Mysterious apparitions have been seen in the graveyards adjoining some of these old churches. There's a very luminescent apparition that is often seen by Charlestonians. She is believed to be a woman who died at the same time her husband died on a ship headed for Boston. Neither knew of the other's demise. Allegedly, this man's ghost haunts a graveyard in Boston. She is known as the Lady in White here in Charleston. And she's been seen even through the thickest of foliage in this graveyard. St. Philip's Church was the first Anglican church organized in the South and is the oldest congregation in Charleston. The original building was constructed in 1710 and became known as one of the most beautiful churches in America. In 1987, two tourists obtained what they believe may be photographic proof of one restless spirit haunting St. Philip's Cemetery. On June 10th of 1987, a local man named Harry Reynolds and his wife were out taking pictures of the city in one of that ultimate postcard shot. The graveyard gates were locked, so Harry put his camera through the bars and snapped a random shot of a row of graves in the back of St. Philip's graveyard. 
When the film was developed, a few days later, it was an image of a woman, a translucent figure kneeling in front of one of the graves as if she were mourning. Harry didn't remember there being a mourning woman in the graveyard that night, so he sent the film back to the Kodak labs where it was processed. After a lot of serious analysis, they determined that it wasn't tampered with. They determined that it wasn't a double exposure. They told him, hey, you figure out who this woman is. The stone in the picture where the woman kneels belongs to a young lady who died when she was 29. The date of her death is June 16th of 1888. She bled to death internally six days after giving birth to a stillborn baby. That infant died June 10th, 1888, the same day, 99 years later, that Harry Reynolds snapped that photograph. According to legend, Charleston is home to many ghosts, from the most famous of actors to the most humble of slaves. In the early 19th century, Charleston was the center of Southern society, commerce, and politics. The wealthy planters and merchants were avid consumers of European culture as well as fashions. In 1736, the Dock Street Theater opened on the south side of what is now Queen Street. That building burned to the ground in 1740. In the early 1800s, the Planters Hotel was built on the site of the original Dock Street Theater, so named because it was popular with the low country plantation owners who would come to Charleston for the market and the winter social season. In 1809, on that spot, they built the Planters Hotel. It's a very bawdy hotel, best known for drunken actors, prostitutes, and the invention of Planters Punch. Now, the hotel fell into ruins after the Civil War. By the turn of the century, it was dilapidated. In 1935 and 1936, it was refurbished through a grant given to the city. The Dock Street Theater was rebuilt on the site of the original theater as part of the New Deal Works Project's administration. Since the Dock Street Theater reopened in 1936, there have been reports of at least two apparitions haunting the building. One is believed to be the spirit of the most famous actor of his time. There's a male ghost often seen in the theater. He's about five foot seven. He wears knee boots. He wears a frock coat that comes to mid thigh. And on occasion, he's seen in a top hat. Legend has it that this is the ghost of Junius Brutus Booth, a great Shakespearean actor, a man who would have been considered the Laurence Olivier of his time. Booth Sr was also the father of John Wilkes Booth, the man who killed Abraham Lincoln. Booth Sr. never played in the Dock Street Theater, but in his lifetime, he often stayed there because in the 1830s, it was the Planters Hotel. There is another apparition associated with the Dock Street Theater, that of a young woman often seen on the second floor of the building. The female ghost on the second floor of the Dock Street Theater is believed to be a prostitute from the 1830s and that she was the victim of a botched abortion. She is seen with red colored hair, which was a popular style of prostitutes in that era. For years, those who've seen her thought they were seeing a woman's ghost walking on her knees down the hallway until they determined that this is actually an apparition walking on the old 1830s floor. In the 1930s, when the building was renovated, the new floorboard was built up and today would cut this woman off at knee level. The Dock Street Theater is today a respected theatrical venue, but perhaps if you listen, you may still hear the footsteps of spirits long departed. In the years preceding the Civil War, Charleston became the most prosperous city in the South. Fundamental to Charleston's success was the thriving slave trade that flourished here during the 18th and early 19th centuries. During that time, Charleston was the main point of entry for slaves into the American mainland. 70% of the slaves who entered America came through Charleston Harbor. Today, the old Slave Mart Museum stands as a somber legacy of this shameful institution. Charleston's wealth came primarily because of, of slave labor. Uh, and 
most of these men considered slaves to be a commodity and would not cringe at separating a family. On the docks of Charleston Harbor, human beings were bought and sold like so much cattle. Often, families were heartlessly torn asunder. It was not unusual for husbands to be separated from their wives or children from their parents, all in the name of commerce. One of Charleston's most poignant ghost stories concerns the child in one such family. The 1837 Bed and Breakfast, a quaint inn on Wentworth Street, is a classic example of the Charleston single house. The original home was built in 1837 by a man named Henry Cobia. In 1984, the home was converted into a bed and breakfast. According to the staff and guests who have stayed there, the inn is haunted by a mischievous spirit of a nine-year-old slave child named George, who lived on the third floor with his parents during the 1830s. In 1843, the owner was forced to sell some of his slaves, including George's parents. George actually witnessed the parents being taken away. The next day, he went down to the waterfront he tried to find his parents and was told they were on a ship moored in the middle of Charleston Harbor. In a desperate attempt at a reunion, he stole a rowboat. About halfway out, he jumped into the water. Not being able to swim, he perished trying to see his parents one more time. He was never seen again. Even the most hardened slave owner in Charleston was saddened by this event. George apparently never really left the house on Wentworth Street. According to staff workers and guests, the spirit of the young boy still plays in the house in which he grew up. I've been working at the bed and breakfast since 1990, and some of my duties include staying here at the night manager position. And oftentimes when I've been asleep, I felt the bed shake, and I knew it was George, so I'm just asking him to stop, and he would stop. And other times, um, guests have told me that have slept in this room that he's come in, through the door, they've heard him, and he'll be walking around, and they'll hear his footsteps walking around the bed. And then he would shake the bed even harder, trying to wake maybe both of the, the couple up, and he would just feel there, and there would be no one there. George has also been known to sometimes turn the lights on. I'll go to bed, and I'll have turned the light out, and I'll wake up, and the light will be on. So that's how I know he's been here. The former manager said that she had talked to guests who had described the rocking chairs rocking back and forth on the porch when there was no wind or anything around. And that in the carriage house, sometimes guests would hear a, a cracking of a whip and they would feel like hear something running. And they would then a few minutes later, this faint smell of hay. I think that just like any little child, he's trying to get our attention when he shakes the beds and when he turns on the lights and he's never done anything wrong. I just think he wants us to know he's here. If you find yourself at the 1837 bed and breakfast, and if you should awaken to the sound of footsteps in your room at night, rest assured, it is only the spirit of a curious nine-year-old boy named George. Charleston City Hall is situated at the northeast corner of Meeting and Broad Street, known as the Four Corners of Law. The building was completed in 1802, and the Charleston City Council meets here to this day. Along the walls of the City Council Chamber are portraits of many of the illustrious persons who served the city and the country. But few men are held in greater esteem by the people of Charleston than General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard. According to legend, his spirit still watches over the people of Charleston. Beauregard was from Louisiana, but he had quickly won the hearts of Charlestonians. He led the attack on Fort Sumter, an act that made his memory sacred to the Confederacy, and directed the defense of the city during the siege by Union forces. Beauregard was also renowned for his high ethical standards, and once he forced a citizen to return money he had embezzled from the state. It is said that Beauregard's ghost still returns to City Hall to search out miscreants and scandal. Woe be to he who dares to rob the city coffers while this vigilant spirit maintains his watch. Beauregard would become famous defending the city during the Civil War, 
but that bloody conflict would also be the source of many other ghost stories. Charleston is perhaps best known as the birthplace of the Confederacy, the flashpoint for the Civil War. It should not be surprising that some of the men who died during this tragic conflict would still haunt the city. In the years leading up to the Civil War, Charleston was a hotbed of secessionist activity. On December 20th, 1860, delegates to the Secession Convention passed the Ordinance of Secession at the South Carolina Institute Hall. Five days later, federal troops stationed at nearby Fort Moultrie withdrew to Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. In January, cadets from the Citadel fired on the Star of the West, a Union ship trying to resupply Fort Sumter. For the next four months, the uneasy standoff continued as secessionist fever continued to rage throughout the South. By March 1861, six more states had seceded from the Union. The Civil War began at 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, when Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter. The Union commander at Fort Sumter was Major Robert Anderson. In one of the many ironies of the war, the Confederate bombardment was directed by General Beauregard, who had been one of Major Anderson's star students at West Point. Charlestonians gathered on the rooftops along the waterfront to watch the bombardment. The Union forces finally surrendered after 34 straight hours of shelling. Remarkably, no one was seriously hurt during the bombardment. But the war had started, and there was no turning back. For the next four years, the nation was plunged into the bloodiest conflict in American history. Seeing Charleston as the symbol of Southern resistance, President Lincoln was determined to subdue the city. In April 1863, federal ironclads and monitors clashed with Confederate forces in Charleston Harbor. Beginning in August, Charleston was under constant attack by Union forces. During the Siege of Charleston, the main line of defense was the string of fortifications along the waterfront area known as the Battery. Many of the antebellum mansions on the Battery survived the war. This elegant home was built in the early 1830s. In 1977, the adjoining carriage house was converted to a small inn. Here, in room 8 of the Battery Carriage House Inn, guests have reported encountering a frightening apparition of a headless torso in a gray uniform. A couple was staying in a roommate from Charlotte, North Carolina, and at around four in the morning, the man opened his eyes and saw an apparition without a head floating at arm's length above his bed. First, he blinked his eyes and turned his head from side to side to make sure he wasn't dreaming. And then he reached up and had the audacity to touch this ghost. He felt very thick, coarse, gray material between his thumb and his forefinger. And when he did so, the ghost let out this menacing, guttural noise. And as he did so, his wife, off to his right, turned, looked, saw the ghost, and shrieked, and the ghost disappeared. According to the couple, the headless apparition seemed to be dressed in a gray tunic, like a Confederate uniform. Is it possible that this is the spirit of one of the defenders of Charleston who died during the Civil War? What we think he is is a Confederate soldier that was stationed at Battery Ramsey, which is right across the street on South Battery from the Battery Carriage House in where we are. And that was a defense the Confederates set up to protect from the Union armies advancing. And when it was thought that Sherman was marching up from Savannah to burn Charleston, Several Confederates were, were commissioned to blow up all the munitions there. A large artillery piece stationed at Battery Ramsey blew up and landed in the top floor of a house on East Battery. We're on South Battery now, and this is where the Confederates stayed while they were manning Battery Ramsey. So we think that this Confederate soldier was maimed during one of these munitions explosions, 
while he was staying here and while he was blowing up the place. And he comes back to haunt room eight. Charleston was spared the torch by General Sherman on his infamous March to the Sea, but the city eventually succumbed to the onslaught. On February 17, 1865, the Confederates withdrew. Union troops marched into Charleston the next day. The proud city had been brought to its knees. There's a legend that says that this area, that war after war, that the ghosts protected this area from aggressors. And during the Civil War, it was said that many of the ghosts from former battles and a lot of our former heroes protected the coastline from the northern aggression. But it's also said that we made those ghosts angry and they left, and that's why the North took over Charleston. Charleston survived the devastation of the Civil War, but restless spirits continue to haunt the city. At the Battery Carriage House Inn, witnesses have encountered the apparition of a well-dressed young man affectionately known as the Gentleman Ghost. He is called the Gentleman Ghost because he sometimes enters the rooms of female guests at night, but he always disappears when the women object. We think the Gentleman Ghost was a young man who lived in this house in the early part of the century. He graduated from Yale University and in the few, first few months after his graduation was very depressed. And for some reason jumped off the top piazza of the battery carriage house. And that's an undeniably tragic story. But the Gentleman Ghost comes back as a very benevolent entity. He haunts room 10 and also he strolls around the grounds of the battery carriage house. Sightings of the gentleman ghost record a wispy apparition, approximately five foot eight of a young man in his early 20s. Dozens of women have reported being wakened up in the middle of the night by this apparition. That's when he politely exits through the wall. Guests are not the only people who've had strange encounters at the inn. According to those who work there, the spirits make themselves known in many ways. One morning, the breakfast server was telling me that he knew that something was here. For he comes in around six o'clock in the morning and the lobby is dark, the doors are locked, and all of a sudden he would hear ding, ding, and I have a little bell like so on my desk. And something was ringing the bell and he would come in and look around and turn the lights on. There was not a thing here. And then I was sitting at my desk one afternoon when I heard the knob on this door rattle like so this. And then the door opened and went all the way back to the wall. At first, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I was not scared because I thought it was the lady of the house. Quite often she will come from her living quarters down the steps and through this door. And I hadn't seen her in a while, so I thought she might be coming to see me. And when she didn't come through the door, I got up from my desk, came around and called her name. There was nobody there and the door was wide open. I'll have to say that it did scare me quite a lot at that point. I didn't understand that, and I don't understand it to this day, but that is exactly what happened. Pirates and patriots, poets and prostitutes, such are the people by which history is made, and such are the stories from which legends are born. But are these accounts of supernatural encounters just stories, or is there some truth in these tales. I'm not exactly sure what ghosts are. I do believe in them, I have experienced them. But what I tell people when they ask me about them is that I don't know if they're actual entities or if they're actually psychological projections or waking dreams. But what I do know is that they are real experiences for a lot of people. And we treat the stories that people share with us with a whole lot of respect. And we certainly treat the spirits of Charleston with a whole lot of respect. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.